Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. For those in the room and those watching online, I'm Gregory Poling. I direct the Southeast Asia program here at CSIS. And this is the fifth installment of our ASEAN Leadership Forum, which we launched last year. We're very happy to have uh, Mari Pangestu, who I will introduce in just a moment. A bit of housekeeping as a reminder, everything you hear today is on the record. This is being live streamed over CSIS and YouTube. So for those who may have to drop out at some point, the video will be available uh, at any point. Um, and if you are online, you also have the opportunity to ask questions. You'll see a box to type them in, and my team will send them over, and I'll read them out to Ibu Mari. Uh, also, the event today is made possible by general support to CSIS. With that, let me introduce our, our guest of honor. So Ibu Mari Pangestu is the outgoing World Bank Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships, a post she took up at the beginning of March uh, 2020. Before that, she served as Indonesia's Minister of Trade from 2004 to 2011, and the Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy from 2011 to 2014. She's also a, a prominent, well-known academic, having served as a senior fellow at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, and a professor of international economics at the University of Indonesia, along with various other affiliations, including at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, the Crawford School of Public Policy at Australian National University, uh, the Indonesia Bureau of Economic Research, and our cousins in Jakarta, the Center for Strategic and International Study, with the R and the E uh, flipped backwards. So with that, let me turn it over for opening remarks from Ibu Mari. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Greg. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to be back at uh, CSIS, uh, the cousin organization of uh, CSIS Jakarta. Uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to share uh, some thoughts on a very uh, important topic, uh, uh, which is what ASEAN is facing in terms of the global challenges, as well as opportunities, uh, I would say. So I'd like to uh, just make th uh, three main points. Uh, one is to just put the context of, of what's happening uh, in ASEAN as well as what's happening uh, in terms of the global challenges. And the second and third points will relate to the, uh, what should be the national and regional responses uh, uh, by Southeast Asia to respond uh, to these uh, various challenges. So first, uh, on the context, uh, I think let, let's start with what's happening in Southeast Asia and ASEAN. I think uh, we, we managed to uh, get out of the COVID quite okay. You know? So if you look at, the, at, at least at, on the growth trends, uh, most of the Southeast Asian countries have been able to recover post-COVID. Uh, most of the countries except Vietnam experienced contraction in 2020, but rebounded in 2021 and 2022 uh, with very strong export growth as well as domestic demand growth on the back of, obviously, uh, the recovery uh, in uh, the US and other advanced economies. I wanted to mention this because it relates back to what it means moving forward. The role of trade and being part of global value chains actually allow East Asia and Southeast Asia to recover more quickly than others. Uh, and the export growth actually came back in 2021. It was already even higher than 2019 uh, levels. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, of course, enjoyed the commodity boom. And most of the uh, Southeast Asian countries are almost back to pre-pandemic uh, levels of uh, GDP. This is, so we are looking good in terms of, uh, compared to other uh, developing countries. But growth is moderating in 2023 because we know the world uh, economy is slowing down, even fears of recession, tighter monetary policy, and less expansionary fiscal policy. So all the projections are showing a lower growth, sometimes even half of uh, 2022 in 2023. Uh, and there are three linked international developments which will impact on this uh, project to slow down. The slowdown in uh, global economy, commodity prices falling, and financial tightening with interest rates uh, remaining high. And there will be some reprieve, I suppose, with China uh, uh, growing faster in 2023 uh, than in 2022. Uh, medium term and longer term challenges, East Asia and Southeast Asia have actually been growing higher than other regions for the last uh, three decades. 
but we are facing a slower growth on average compared to previous three decades. And therefore, uh, catching up or the, what we call convergence to the higher income status is going to be slower. And this is, this is actually not just in Southeast Asia, but for all developing countries. So uh, we are facing, again, in a more serious way, what, what's called the middle income trap. Um, uh, and uh, uh, other key trends, this is, uh, if you want to read all the details, it's in the, the most recent East Asia uh, Pacific Economic Outlook of the, of the World Bank. Other key trends, declining productivity growth, decline in the share of manufacturing GDP, except for Vietnam and Cambodia, potential for new digital technologies to boost productivity growth in services sector, uh, although services reform sector is going to be much needed. Longer term ch challenges. So this is because we are talking about what needs to be done nationally and regionally moving forward. Longer term challenges, decoupling. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about decoupling, you know, the fears of defragmentation uh, and decoupling. Uh, aging. So uh, this is the, uh, we, we always think when we talk about aging, we used to just talk about China and Japan. But actually ASEAN, uh, especially Thailand, is already facing uh, the issue of aging. Uh, and adaptation to climate. These are the three longer term challenges. And I would add uh, human capital uh, losses that happened during COVID, uh, which if you don't address them now, you will uh, you know, not be able to address your productivity issue. And so uh, the, the recommendation is domestic reforms on macrofinancial structural reforms and climate related reforms. That's the kind of the national agenda. But I just want, I want to focus today more on the international cooperation agenda because you need international cooperation to address these global challenges, whether it's climate change or ensuring openness to trade, uh, investment and technology flows, which has been the mainstay for ASEAN uh, development and growth in the last uh, three decades. So let me just mention a few of the key global challenges, which is very familiar, I'm sure, to, to everybody uh, uh, in, uh, physically in this room, the audience physically in this room, as well as those online. It's the poly crisis, it's the pandemic, food, energy, security, war in Ukraine, and the climate crisis all happening at the same time, and they're linked, yeah? So the climate crisis is linked to the, to the pandemic and so on. And of course, the heightened political tensions between the US and China. So the geopolitical tensions and rivalry are leading to uncertainties in, in the policies because many policies are coming out of it. And for ASEAN, we are still facing the Myanmar issue and the South China Seas uh, issue. Uh, and in particular, the, the rivalry between, between US and China, uh, the reassertion of uh, great power rivalry in, us, in Asia threatens to undermine Asia's economic and political security and deep regional economic integration uh, and political cooperation, which is the, again, underpinning Asia and Southeast Asia growth and development in the last three decades. So this is the, the, the my main message is how do we ensure that we can continue regional economic cooperation, integration, and political cooperation uh, in the face of all these challenges. Uh, because what we're seeing is uh, kind of the traditional reaction is the traditional security reaction, unwinding economic inter interdependence. We use, in, in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, we always saw economic inter interdependence and regional security as linked. We've always seen that back uh, even from the inception of ASEAN. Uh, but now uh, we are seeing economic interdependence as a security issue. And so unwinding it is, uh, is, is, is what's trying, being trying to happen. Prioritizing military deterrence and strengthening military force to achieve political ends. So we are, and we are seeing economic instruments being used for security objectives. And in the, in the midst of all that, we are seeing post COVID uh, with all the disruptions of global supply chains that happened uh, during the last uh, three years, uh, a, a, an increased concern well, for uh, between efficiency in terms of location for trade and investment versus resilience to shocks, whether it's natural disaster or pandemic, security issues, you don't wanna be uh, dependent on concentrated supplies, whether it's vaccines, raw materials, food, or energy, and geopolitics uh, is in the mix of that, of techno 
techno competition and rivalry, rivalry between US and China. What has been the uh, implications or manifestation of this? We all, we've all known about this. Tariff wars between US and China. Uh, trade restrictions to ensure domestic supply uh, and other considerations. Restrictions or, or incentives and subsidies for investment, whether it's domestic or foreign, to attract back reshoring and friendshoring subsidies for green technologies uh, and critical, critical goods such as semiconductors. So you've got the IRA, you've got the CHIPS Act. Local content uh, policies are uh, emerging everywhere, not just in the US, but also uh, in uh, developing countries. Um, and this has led to the reconfiguration of global value chains and a very, very uncertain policy environment for trade and investment recovery, which is the mainstay for Southeast Asia, in, whether it's the short term or the longer term. And all these dynamics uh, risk global political and economic fragmentation or worse, which is war, right? So we, hopefully we don't go there, but at least we need to think about how to address uh, this global political and economic fragmentation. So in the remaining time, let me try to uh, just address the next two points, which is uh, the, how should we respond to the US, how should Southeast Asia respond to the China rivalry and the siloed approach between security and economics? Uh, how should we navigate this? Uh, and not be drawn to either side. I mean, if you look at the, all the statements made by uh, ASEAN leaders, including right now, I, I, maybe it's already completed, the ASEAN summit is happening. Uh, and there, there, there are statements there to say that we, we want to be, uh, we want to remain outside of this uh, rivalry. Uh, we, wanna, we don't want to be drawn to either side. Uh, and we want to uh, be able to maintain our regional order uh, because we have been able to develop as a peaceful uh, region due to regional economic integration and political cooperation in combination. Uh, and so as the, the, the proposal is for ASEAN uh, to uh, come up with a, a counter narrative. I think uh, this is what, what is being uh, developed as a thought, as a vision and a concept. Uh, I'm, I'm sharing with you some thoughts uh, of the, the track two that I'm involved in, uh, that uh, apart from issues of Myanmar, South China Seas, uh, and uh, strengthening TAC and so on within the ASEAN uh, chairmanship uh, of Indonesia year, uh, we, we are proposing that there should be a counter narrative for, uh, from middle powers such as ASEAN collectively to balance this zero sum logic of great uh, power political competition and reinforce the institutions and agreements that safeguard what has been uh, so crucial for ASEAN, which is an open, pluralistic, and cooperative regional order. What does that really mean? It, it, you know, in the ASEAN context, uh, if those of you who are uh, ASEANists will know that we always link the political uh, and the regional and the economic uh, prosperity uh, uh, together, and that has been the pillars of uh, peace, prosperity, and resilience. So uh, how do you implement that? How do you uh, revise that vision given a today's situation? So uh, the idea is a vision of comprehensive regional security that uh, emphasizes economic openness and interdependence as critical elements of regional and national security interdependence. So you are talking about traditional security concerns uh, or military, of, with military considerations as well as non-traditional security considerations such as climate and pandemic together. So it's about the integration of all these uh, economic, uh, climate change, environment, human security, uh, health and military challenges should be addressed in an integrated way. That's kind of the main uh, idea. Uh, and the suggestion is to come up with uh, the vision of a comprehensive security to address today's uh, very complex situation and not be drawn, you know, uh, to the different uh, uh, competition for geopolitical uh, rivalry. Uh, and it is about uh, uh, coming up with the principles of this vision uh, uh, and, and some of this uh, in, in this year of ASEAN chairmanship of Indonesia, such as going back to the principles of non-alignment, non-interference, -interfer settlement by peaceful and consultative means, 
effective cooperation recognizing multilateralism, open regionalism, and international openness. These are principles. And coming up with that document, uh, which comes up with the, within the ASEAN context, but inviting other dialogue partners to join. Uh, and, how do you, and then coming up with a roadmap to implement that through strengthening established arrangements and building new arrangements to secure cooperation, such as what you already have on the table, uh, the ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific, the TAC or Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, and on the economic side, uh, deepening, strengthening, broadening uh, RCEP. Uh, and this will position ASEAN as the center point of global development and openness in a time of global uncertainty. So uh, th this is the idea of agency, that ASEAN uh, and uh, op with its concepts of open regionalism and integration of politics uh, and security and economics uh, can show the way instead of having this very disruptive uh, global order that we are seeing sets out the principles on which ASEAN engages all powers, big and small. So you want to be continuing to have engagement with both US uh, and China, and invite other dialogue partners to join, and uh, refocuses regional dip dip diplomacy, not on this uh, geopolitical rivalry, but on development and cooperation, and away from a great power competition. Uh, and identify a process, you know, so you're not just talking in the normative, but then what are the ASEAN processes uh, that uh, you need to strengthen, uh, processes and institutions that you need to strengthen to be able to be able to, to, be able to respond to this. Uh, final point uh, will be on uh, how to rethink uh, national and uh, regional policy responses to the increased uh, riskiness of uncertainty of the world trade environment and ensure that we can uh, recover in the short term and in the medium term. Because ASEAN theme this year is ASEAN matters, epicentrum of growth, right? So how do we continue to grow given all those challenges? Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm up to my 15 minutes already, so I'm gonna be very brief on this and we can pick it up uh, in, in the discussion. Uh, I think uh, the, the upshot of uh, what I have tried to uh, look at all, all that's happening, despite all the uh, risks and uh, uncertainties of decoupling and defragmentation. If you look at what's, what the figures are showing is that despite the trade wars, uh, China's importance in world trade has in fact increased and China is more central to global trade than ever. Uh, and global value chains have in become actually increasingly more important as part of uh, t global trade. It's about 52% now. Uh, it had gone down uh, during the global financial crisis. And this is very important. Firms continue to seek customers, markets, suppliers, and partners from all around the world because the answer to addressing all those concerns, whether it's uh, uh, resilience, security, or geopolitics, is d uh, diversification and deconcentration and developing more global and regional value chains. So this, this is what ASEAN needs to respond to. And despite the trade restrictions, you have trade liberalization happening, including deepening of trade agreements, including uh, RCEP. And the US-China trade war implication is probably the only one that we, because it's happened for five years, where we have seen what has happened. What has happened is that, as you can expect, US trade to China and China trade to uh, US went down. But third country trade to China and the US, especially to the US, has gone up. So what's happened is relocation. Uh, and who have benefited from the relocation? Southeast Asia, especially Vietnam, uh, the numbers are showing it's Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore. And countries like Turkey and Mexico and Korea are also benefited. Oh, Philippines is in there too. And the analysis is showing it's country-specific factors, whether they are, have a regional agreement, you know, like Mexico with the U.S. and then the, the regional agreement in, in, um, in Asia. And, of course, the country-specific factors regarding that, their attractiveness for relocation. Uh, and uh, so really the conclusion is that uh, uh, we still need to pursue 
op continued openness, uh, but recognize the challenges. And there are two, I just want to mention two other uh, important trends that we have to, ASEAN and Southeast Asia have to respond to, which is that competitiveness is no longer just about producing at the lowest cost location, but being part of the sustainable supply chain. This is becoming increasingly uh, like the CBAM from Europe uh, already translated into policy and companies, buyers are, uh, and investors uh, want to locate where you are part of the uh, sustainable supply chain. And that includes all the way to the supply of energy being renewable. And the role of increases, uh, the ro increased role of services trade in global value chain uh, and the outsourcing of uh, business services, all kinds of business services. You will see the numbers that show that during, the COVID, during COVID, actually tourism and travel plummeted, but modern business services actually went up and uh, was uh, uh, helping many countries like Malaysia uh, to, uh, 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 to uh, really respond uh, and recover. So the conclusion is that global value chains, trade and specialization, scale, and increased scope of diversification is going to be continued important drivers of growth for developing countries, including Southeast Asia. And therefore, whatever you do domestically and regional coordination is going to be very important. So besides the domestic reforms, deepening and broadening regional trade agreements and having a voice in WTO, so I think we have a role, so agency role, uh, to continue multilater multilateralism. And finally, the reality is that you will still see these, um, what, what would you call it, uh, uh, still the defragmentation and de the decoupling, which we think will happen not for all trade, but for whatever they call, whatever definition is going to come out, uh, what is critical goods and critical raw materials. And, and the, the, the saying now is high wall and small garden. So uh, we still, we, how can ASEAN take the opportunity of this high wall and small garden? How can we be the friend uh, in the friend shoring? Uh, just to give you an example on the critical rare uh, materials and the EV subsidy under IRA, where, uh, where friends are being defined as uh, countries that have an FTA with the US. And of course, Europe and Japan have overcome this by, okay, we have a, a limited minerals trade agreement with the US, and that gets them to have a subsidy. Uh, uh, they, they, they can enjoy the subsidy uh, from the EV. So uh, right now, it's being discussed. IPEF may be uh, uh, an opportunity to define uh, that uh, friend uh, agreement that can get the ASEAN countries, which have uh, the rare materials uh, and nickel and cobalt, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, and Malaysia, uh, to be specific, they can also benefit from this. So uh, that, that's uh, really, you know, do the, the big things and the important things of keeping the open regionalism and multilateralism, but uh, operate also in, in, inside that high wall and small garden. Uh, let me close there. Thank you. Thank you, Eva Mari. I can tell that after all this time in government and at the World Bank, you remain an optimist because you, <laughs> you ended with a nice thing to say about IPEF. Um, let me start uh, with a few questions about ASEAN. Um, when you were in government in Indonesia, it was a moment of great uh, activity and ambition for ASEAN, the ASEAN Charter, the ASEAN Community, the successes in bringing together intra-regional trade it seems that ASEAN has become far more reactive in the decades since. Even the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific is a, a defensive response to things that were taking place outside of the institution. How does ASEAN recapture its agency, you know, instead of just responding to things it doesn't like from the US and Japan and China? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I kind of alluded to that in my remarks in saying that ASEAN needs to not be pulled in either China or uh, US camp and not be pulled by Japan or others in terms of what the regional order should look like. ASEAN should determine what is the important regional order for them. And uh, you're right, you know, uh, maybe I'm an optimist because it's, it's kind of like an every 10 year thing that you have a major jump in, uh, in, in how ASEAN moves forward. 
and it's usually when Indonesia is, is the chair. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying anything about that, but uh, you know, because I experienced 2003 and I experienced 2011. Those were the two times that Indonesia was chair. So this is why uh, we are really saying that this, year, this is the year for the next jump, which is this comprehensive security idea. And uh, how, how do you convince the ASEAN leaders of this narrative? Uh, because I think, I think everybody's kind of focused either on their domestic elections or on uh, re economic recovery of their country. They're not looking at the big picture. So what we are trying to say in the narrative, and uh, we have all the, all the numbers and the simulations and the models to show it, that if you let this world order go as it is going, which is defragmentation and uh, decoupling, the costs are very high. Yeah? And we are going to suffer. Uh, the, uh, the, the cost is going to be borne by developing countries, mostly. And it will uh, affect the growth model uh, that has been so important for ASEAN in the last uh, three decades. And that it cannot just be economics and security. The, the, the integration between the security and the economics and, then, and the non-traditional security issues like climate and uh, health need to come together and be in an integrated way. And this is, should be our vision of what is the regional order. Because we are about development. We are about prosperity. And to achieve prosperity, you need peace. And the way for resilience is to continue your open uh, regional integration uh, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is what we are trying to uh, uh, impart the message to the leaders. Am I optimistic or pessimistic? I don't know. <laughs> but I think we need to shout that message very, very loudly because the alternative is, is just really not a very good alternative in this world of defragmentation. So can we, can we, be, can we uh, be the agent to show the way forward? You know, maybe we can't succeed fully, but as long as we can try to maintain the principles of what has been successful for ASEAN and try to maintain that within our region, whether it's uh, the ASEAN, uh, uh, let's say on the trade side, the ASEAN and the RCEP and plus plus. And I would say IPEF is in there as well. We should also uh, use IPEF to continue this, this path of, uh, for one of a better world, uh, word, uh, open regionalism and manage the, this US-China rivalry within that context. Because actually firms, as long as you can still be open everywhere else and you have clear rules on rules of origin and trade facilitation, uh, China can be relocating, US is also relocating, and you will still have uh, uh, regional value chains which, uh, which can still uh, lead to development and growth. Um, you know, ASEAN's greatest successes maybe were in the economic community and you know, lowering tariff barriers, lowering non-tariff barriers, facilitating movement of, of labor, particularly skilled labor. Um, but all of the things at the heart of your speech, the digital economy and supply chains and climate, they're not in the ASEAN economic community. Is ASEAN prepared to kind of enter the 21st century economic debate, or is it still stuck patting itself on the back over legacy issues? I think it's trying to move forward. So if you look at the so-called 16, <laughs> there are 16 deliverables for the ASEAN uh, year this year, you've got climate in there, you've got uh, digital in there, and some of, and, and there is also <coughs> the, uh, the, if you talk about ASEAN processes, you know, you're reviewing you have to review RCEP, you have to review all the plus, uh, plus one ASEAN FTAs with Australia and New Zealand, with Japan. So it's an opportunity actually to up, update your agreements to include issues of climate change, uh, supply chain resiliency and digital. And we are also having to respond to IPEF because IPEF has a whole uh, still controversial uh, text on digital, but it's there, right? And it's putting all the issues on digital. Uh, whether or not we'll get an agreement is, is another thing, but knowing that you have to address these issues, whether it's the localization of servers or uh, privacy issues, uh, standards and regulations, these are issues that uh, we are already facing, uh, and it's part of RCEP, but implementation-wise, it's a question mark. 
I would say one of the positive things that that will that have that has already been uh, that was already announced, I think, during the G20 year of Indonesia, was uh, co cooperation in ASEAN payments system between the ASEAN five, which will allow e-commerce to operate. So it's basically agreeing on the QR code and agreeing on uh, recognition uh, of what the interoperability of the of the payment system between the ASEAN countries. That that's that's already happened, right? So things like that uh, will will continue to happen, but. Uh, I, I think uh, on climate, this is going to be uh, the big challenge. Whether or not uh, ASEAN can, uh, can come up with uh, uh, a response to climate change, which is ASEAN-wide. Uh, you know, you, are you going to have a net zero that's going to be ASEAN? And are you going to cooperate on, on energy, for instance? There is in there a cooperation on energy. And I think they're brushing off an old idea about the ASEAN grid for energy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I always thought it was a good idea, but it, it, it got into a lot of uh, issues. But, you know, it's about time uh, to uh, revisit that. And there's this, uh, I, I don't know whether you have heard of the Ju Just Energy Transition Partnerships, which uh, is between G7 and at least two of the ASEAN countries, Indonesia and Vietnam, which is the intention is to provide funding. Because, you know, you need, for energy transition, you need funding uh, uh, to you know, get out early from coal. And, and this, this is uh, uh, something that the World Bank as well as the G7 countries are working on. That, that could be another potential. And finally, uh, uh, the issue of uh, sustainable oceans, uh, uh, waste management, uh, and uh, what, you, what you call the carbon, the carbon sink. Uh, uh, with mangrove restoration and, and so on, which is what Indonesia is, is also uh, focusing on. Uh, those are uh, potential areas for uh, ASEAN cooperation also. But it does, the final thing I would say is that it does need to be translated into a climate and development strategy for each of these ASEAN countries. And our nar the narrative that we have been trying to impress on each country as well as ASEAN-wide is that you have to do this not because uh, of, of, of the climate change issue per se, but the link between climate change and development, because if you don't address it, the cost to development is going to be very high. And by the way, it's going to be part of competitiveness now to be part of the sustainable supply chain. Uh, investors uh, and trading partners are going to look at your longer term climate change uh, and development plans. So actually, uh, just a final word on that, a bit of advertisement, I guess, from my time at the World Bank. We were doing this climate change and development reports. And uh, for Vietnam, and it, there's one for Vietnam and there's one for Indonesia. And that narrative about com competitiveness actually uh, was an important one for Vietnam uh, to sign on to wanting to have this uh, longer term climate and development plan. Uh, plan is one thing, right? Implementation is another thing. And there's a lot of issue about financing in there. I'll, I'll close that. Right. <laughs> one more for me, and then we'll open it to the audience. And for those in the room, if you want to ask a question, just head over to the stand mic, and I'll, I'll recognize you. Um, the the economy, the post-COVID economy, especially the digital economy, um, is a space where I think traditional concepts of comparative advantage at the national level get evened out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, Southeast Asian nations are competing against each other as much as they are competing against the outside world. In particular, when you go around the region, you don't have to have very many conversations before you get a lot of griping about why everybody goes to Vietnam. Why isn't, why isn't more manufacturing setting up in the Philippines or Indonesia? Does that become a drag on ASEAN cohesion in the years ahead, whether it's on critical minerals or digital economy or semiconductor manufacturing? Yeah, this is, this is indeed a big challenge, as I was saying earlier, that how can we uh, rise above kind of our national uh, navel gazing to a, a more regional, that we are stronger as a region, which used to be a kind of how uh, we were able to go to the ASEAN free trade area and then the ASEAN economic community and the RCEP, that you are stronger using your complementarities rather than competing. Uh, but unfortunately, 
uh, the signs are not that good at the moment because each country is having their own uh, industrial policy and local content requirements. Say, take, take EV as an example. Uh, everybody's trying to have the EV uh, hub in their uh, country, whereas what you should be looking at is kind of, kind of a complementary uh, relationship. And there is a, a plan for, uh, I think it's called ASEAN EV Ecosystem. I don't quite know what's going to go in there, but I'm a little bit fearful. And, and I think we have to really show that uh, to have uh, EV, it's very, you have to have different components and you have to be open because you may have the nickel, but you need other minerals to, to make the battery and you need, other te you need technologies from different countries and you need the, the market. You need to have the domestic market as well as the export market to have the scale to develop the batteries. And that means continued openness to trade and investment. And I think that's actually that's what a, a lot of re, uh, research is being, uh, uh, you know, kind of what I believe in evidence-based policy making. This is what, what uh, some of the analysis that I've seen is trying to show that you can't do it alone. You gotta do it either regionally or globally. It, it only makes sense regionally or globally. Uh, decoupling and defragmentation is very costly. Uh, and it's going to, the cost is being borne by the consumers and the developing countries that it cannot be part of the, of the, of the regional or global value chain. Thank you. All right. First question from the audience, please, uh, if you could identify yourself too. Yes, of course. Um, my name is Gabriel Cabanas. I'm a research associate at the Council on Foreign Relations for Trade Policy. So my questions will very heavily revolve around that. Um, I was curious, and I had a two-part question. First is, as you were mentioning, ASEAN cooperation is very important um, to strengthen bonds within ASEAN and to strengthen the um, ability of ASEAN in the international stage as well. Um, however, you see multiple international agreements signed by separate ASEAN countries, including the CPTPP and the currently in, um, in discussion IPEF. Um, do you see these agreements, you know, complementing ASEAN as an organization as well? And how can the countries better use these agreements to further their own um, strengths in the international stage? And my second question was on the European Union's uh, CBAM, recently implemented. Um, you know, carbon border adjustment mechanism is a very important mechanism for the European Union. And how do you see ASEAN, you know, working together to respond to the CBAM and ensure cooperation with the EU and ASEAN moving forward on further environmental regulations of the sort. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I think we, in terms of these, I wouldn't call them competing uh, agreements. You've got CPTPP, you've got RCEP, and you've got IPEF. And they're, they're slightly different in, in the sense that we, some people said RCEP, they, they used to say RCEP was TPP light when TPP was still around, uh, in the sense that RCEP was seen as kind of a less ambitious agreement compared to, uh, to CPTPP. Uh, but we always said that, look, in ASEAN, there's always an what we call an evolutionary process. You start with perhaps not the lowest common denominator, but a less ambitious agreement. But the idea is to uh, ratchet up. Uh, and. CPTPP or TPP at the time could be a good benchmark to aspire to, right? And, and that's exactly what's trying to happen uh, as you, you know, it's already, uh, we're already in the second year of, of uh, implementation of RCEP. You're supposed to review it. There's an in, built-in review. After three years, you're supposed to review it. And this is the time to review it, to look at uh, CPTPP as well as as what we talked about earlier, how would you embed climate change, how would you embed uh, some uh, digital and so on more, uh, more, uh, more into the, the agreement to be updated. Now, IPEF is a bit different because guess what? IPEF is not a trade agreement <laughs> and there's no enforcement. I don't think there's going to be enforcement provisions in there. There's no market access. It's a lot of it is aspiration. Uh, but aspirations may be okay. You know, I, I will, I'm, I'm an optimist. You can, you can tell you I'm an optimist. Uh, you know, what, just different uh, processes, different uh, pathways always matter. You know, I, I've been around long enough to know that, like, for instance, to me, IPEF is a little bit similar to APEC 
because APEC was also aspirational, <laughs> non-binding agreements and all that. But it, had, it, it, uh, it involved uh, these countries in discussions. So they heard, these are, this is what the aspiration is for best practices and, and, uh, and, and, and benchmarks, right? So you kind of know, uh, you may not agree, uh, especially on digital, I know there's like big di differences, even between US and Europe, there's big differences in digital. But at least you know, right? You're being exposed to, to what could be the way forward. You may not agree, but you, and, and some of it may filter back into the agreements, but it won't be through IPEF, in, in my view. IPEF, uh, to the extent that it can provide technical assistance and uh, cooperation and maybe one of the more concrete things is this supply chain resilience in the uh, I, I think I'm not sure that what will be announced in at the end of the month at the at the APEC ministers meeting responsible for trade uh, uh, whether or not for instance IPEF can be included as part of friend uh, a, a definition of being friends and allies and therefore you can then uh, 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 come into the agreement but I, I think uh, they are, I would say they are complementary. And if I was ASEAN and uh, an ASEAN national country, I would try to leverage all of them uh, in, in a way for my own country as well as for the regional outcomes. For the European Union and CBAM, uh, this is, you know, it's, it's also showing that the world in terms of responding to uh, the need for climate issues and sustainable supply chain are adopting different approaches. The Europeans are using taxes, the Americans are using subsidies, right? Uh, and the World Trade Organization is, 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 should be the one that determines whether these uh, what, uh, board adjustments, adjustment mechanisms are fair and uh, you are using uh, transparent, uh, very viable measures of carbon uh, intensity because otherwise it's gonna hurt the developing countries. Right, so this is uh, for ASEAN and for developing countries in general, we really need to make sure that whatever agreements that, that uh, of carbon and trade need to involve us in the discussion. And if the benchmark is here and we're here, we need the, the capacity building and the adjustments mechanisms to be able to get there. But coming to an agreement on uh, how to measure uh, carbon intensity is going to be key. Thanks. All right, let's take our first question from the online audience. Uh, this comes from Wisnu Yogaswara, who's at the USC Marshall School of Business. How can Southeast Asian nations effectively balance economic development and environmental sustainability amid rising global challenges such as climate change and geopolitical tensions? I think we have to be very clear, and this is, uh, I think, my last three years at the bank, this has been my, uh, my uh, what would you call it, my, my, uh, fight for looking at climate and development in an integrated way. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to come naturally to many, but it's uh, it actually when we, when we look at the, at the numbers, the modeling and so on, you can actually show uh, that you can achieve both. Because previous to maybe a couple of years ago, developing countries look at climate and development as trade-offs. They're not trade-offs. Because if you don't address uh, climate, you are going to hurt your development, and we can show that. It's going to lead to lower growth, lower jobs, uh, lower productivity because of the health outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. It can be shown, and uh, the narrative is, is there. But then when, it, when you go to a developing country and say, look, this is going to hurt you here, and this is what you need to do, the transformations in the energy, transportation, uh, urban infrastructure, food and land use, uh, and uh, main systems that need to be changed uh, does cost you, but it, it is about investment actually. Investing in this is going to yield you higher growth, etc., in the longer run. And then developing countries' response is always, okay, fine and well, you want us to be ambitious, but the financing, where is the financing going to come from? And this is where, uh, you know, it's not going to come from, uh, it's not manna from heaven. You need to have the commitment as a country. So two things need to happen at the, at the country level. First of all is a, a buy-in on the commitment that climate and development are not trade-offs, that you need to have an integrated long-term climate and development strategy, which is underpinned by clear economic 
policy and institutional reforms, uh, including like energy. Energy is probably the, one of the more complicated ones. Uh, and uh, a commitment on the budget side. This is, uh, in terms of my fiscal uh, capability, this is how much I can do. And in terms of SOE reforms, this is what I uh, am committed to do. You know, like take South Africa or even Indonesia, for example. Energy transition is not going to happen without uh, reform of the uh, state-owned enterprise electricity uh, monopoly. Uh, that, that is now uh, part of the issue of the energy transition. So you have to lay out your commitment, and that's the only way investments are going to come in, whether it's concessional funding uh, from the multilateral development banks or from philanthropies or private sector, and they will come in combination. So this is really uh, what we, that is the main message of the climate and development strategy that we are proposing to countries. And uh, these climate and development reports uh, have been, uh, have the intention to describe what needs to be done. Of course, a lot of detailing needs to come out of that. And you, maybe you don't need to do everything, but if you start with one part of it to show the, your commitment, that's already a good path forward. So that, that's how I would advise uh, most countries to do, including uh, Indonesia. Thanks. Another one from the floor? Sure. Um, thank you, Bumari, for coming to talk to us today. So my question just kind of deals with this. So in terms of like how people talk about great power competition and outside influences on Southeast Asia, to talk about US, China, Japan, all these kind of countries, but one player they never mentioned is India, which is like you know a really big player and it's emerging in its own right as a, as a world power. So I guess it's like with that in mind, I guess since you've been in the government in the past, I think it's like, my question is like, why has in the past Southeast Asia, ASEAN in general kind of ignored India relative to the China and the US, and you know, even though they're a really good potential partner, and you know, going forward with them rising as, as, as like a global power, what influence do you see that bringing into Southeast Asia and like, just like global politics in general, like Southeast Asia's place within it? Thank you. Ooh, that's a difficult question to answer diplomatically. <laughs> <laughs> It's not for one of trying, okay? Yes. Uh, we have tried very much to engage with India, starting with the ASEAN India yes. uh, Free Trade Agreement, which was the last uh, to be completed in negotiations, and I would say was the, the hardest to negotiate. And uh, would be, if you, if you use benchmarks of uh, free trade agreements, is probably the least, um, what would you call it? The least, uh, opening up, yeah, the least, with the least uh, level of openness, because they, they were very insistent on, for instance, uh, very uh, strict rules of origin and very long uh, uh, timelines. Uh, and we did try, uh, they were part of the RCEP negotiations, uh, and they were there till the last, uh, in, in the, at the end of, was it 2018 or 2019, until the last, but then they pulled out uh, at the last minute. Uh, it's not for one of trying, and it's, it's also, uh, we should continue to try, because once you have India as part of East Asia, I think that is really going to be uh, uh, beneficial for all. And, in, and, and, in, and you shouldn't see uh, what people miss, uh, pe people miss the point about RCEP as, you know, what's, what's the point of RCEP? We already have uh, bilateral FTAs between all of us. But, the, but we don't have uh, agreements between uh, each other, right? And that's what you will achieve with RCEP, especially with India in there. And India has a lot to gain, and we have a lot to gain from India, especially from the services sector, because they're very strong on the digital side, right? Uh, India is very fearful of China. India is very fearful of losing out on the manufacturing side. Uh, but China was, was actually in the RCEP negotiations, was actually quite willing to have very long timelines uh, to, you know, in, uh, to uh, appease uh, India. Uh, so I, I still hope that, uh, we, we were still hoping that, especially now uh, India is the chair of G20, that they would consider this. And this should be part of, uh, it's, it's another pathway uh, other than their Indo-Pacific pathway. Um, because Indo-Pacific uh, is, it's not just economic, by the way. I'm sure all of you who are here are very knowledgeable about this. It's obviously also about security, right? So uh, I, 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 I think uh, I, I'm still a proponent for <laughs> engaging, continuing to engage with India, uh, because it will be very important for them to be part of this. Thank you. I'm an optimist. <laughs>
Uh, we need those, yes. particularly around Washington, D.C. So uh, let's go back to the online audience. We have another question from Wisnu at USC Marshall School of Business. The rest okay. of the online audience is being shy. Uh, what strategies can Southeast Asian nations implement to promote global peace and reduce political tensions between China and the U.S.? Uh, well, I kind of tried to answer that in my uh, second point. Uh, I think we need to adopt what, what we are calling a comprehensive security, uh, a comprehensive regional security approach, where you know ASEAN, ha the, the way ASEAN was created, has always been about, uh, you know, you, you, in a way, the political uh, cooperation and peace precedes the economics, uh, and then once uh, we have the the, the economic, uh, the ASEAN. Uh, uh, develop, uh, it was always about how economic interdependence is a key part of uh, regional security and political cooperation. They were not separated. Now we need to revisit that and uh, put it in the, in the context of today uh, to, to, to say this is the regional uh, open uh, economic order and political cooperation order that we should desire for our region to be able to counter the winds of not being pulled one way or another. Uh, and it should be based on our principles uh, of openness, pluralism, inclusiveness, uh, and uh, non-aligned, <laughs> uh, and so on. Uh, and, and, we should, and, and it should be a comprehensive security, uh, traditional military and non-traditional, non like climate change and human uh, security, economics, uh, uh, health and food and uh, energy security. You know, these are kind of the, the comprehensive approach and see it in an interdependent and interlinked way that it's not siloed, right? And that way we can, uh, we can uh, be the agent for what needs to be, uh, we need to continue to uh, uh, be uh, propo pro proponents of multilateralism and open regionalism, basically, that's what it is. Uh, but at the same time, I think when we face uh, particular carve-outs of issues that are going to be uh, political uh, defragmentation or decoupling, we can also take a stance of, uh, tr uh, you know, where's the opportunity for us and how can we still take that opportunity uh, without also being brought down the, the, the bad path of, uh, of high costs of uh, local content, reshoring home, uh, uh, bringing everything home and local content and so on. Uh, but you actually uh, leverage on the regional integration to be part of being an ally or, or the French shoring. So, I mean, that, that's kind of uh, the approach. Now, that's how do you translate from concept to implementation of the based on the existing agreements and institutions. That's the hard part, because ASEAN um, is, has, has, is facing challenges in terms of capability and leadership and uh, political will and political commitment. So uh, I think the more people, uh, and whether it's within the government or in, a, in track two that, you know, have a clear message that if you don't do this, it's gonna really hurt ASEAN, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and I the individual countries uh, in terms of its development and growth path, and jobs, poverty reduction, and so on. So I, I think that's, that's kind of the narrative that we're trying to build that, you know, uh, what, what do you call it? A scare, scare you into action. That was always my strategy. <laughs> and you know, like in 2000, there was a time when ASEAN was slowing down, right? And I think it was 90, in the end of the 90s when we actually accelerated the ASEAN free trade area because we were facing a global recession. So, you know, that's, a crisis can generate action, put it that way. I'm not sure it'll work this time, uh, but hey, I'm an optimist, so the more uh, we, we can provide the evidence and the narrative that's appealing to leaders to, uh, and so on, this is, I hope all of you here and in the audience will also help uh, with that message. Uh, let me uh, reinsert myself into the, into the Q&A here. Because we haven't talked much about the WTO, but you've, you've referenced it several times. And there's, I, I think, a fair amount of debate about the future and the role of the WTO and whether or not mm -hmm. we've run out of gas. And I'll note that mm -hmm. 
the U.S. is clearly thumbing its nose at the WTO when it came to the steel and aluminum tariffs. Indonesia has also thumbed its nose at the WTO when it came to the ban on uh, mineral exports. Is the WTO going to recover some of its um, mojo? <laughs> okay, at least you, you didn't say that the WTO was irrelevant. Because so. some people say, oh, forget the WTO, right? So first of all, uh, uh, we, can't, uh, you know, we can't reinvent the WTO. You, you couldn't uh, if you tried. So really it's a question of how do you, uh, how do you uh, continue to have a WTO that can still, you still need uh, uh, a world trading system which is based on rules uh, and, uh, and, uh, and principles, right? And I still think if you did a review of uh, businesses that will still come out as, uh, as important. Uh, certainty and predictability, right? Uh, but of course, at the moment, it's being much weakened. Uh, so if you take, uh, so what does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, in, in the short term, the, one of the more, more urgent issues is, of course, the dispute settlement uh, process. So uh, we know that the issue is with the US uh, not agreeing to appoint any appellate uh, body members. And so there's all these disputes going. It doesn't mean that you can't resolve the disputes. The consultation happens, the disputes are go through the panel and then a decision is made. But then if you don't agree with the decision, there's no appeal. <laughs> so, and then therefore, what, what does country do, like Indonesia or like the US? We ignore the decision, right? But the process and the principles are still happening. So what, what's one, one temporary solution? So I'm, I'm a great believer in, as you will uh, say, uh, recall when I was talking about APEC and IPEC, I'm a great believer in keeping the bicycle movement moving. This is kind of coming from Fred Berkston uh, way back when. What does that mean? It means whatever you can do to keep things moving in the direction that you want it to move, then you should do it. So what, on dispute settlement, have you heard of MCIA? Don't ask me what it stands for. I keep on forgetting what it stands for, but it's, it's about 53 countries that have agreed to uh, uh, have an appellate system. And it's, it's 27 of it is the European countries. China is in there, Australia is in there, and a number of ASEAN countries in there. So we have, we are also, been, we have also been proposing that all ASEAN countries should join the MCIA. It will help you to resolve disputes and have an appellate process for the 53 or so, it's now 60 countries, I think, of the 60 countries that are in there. But it's still minus the US, but China is in there and Australia is in there. So uh, that's talking about keeping the bicycle movement moving and keeping the WTO reforms uh, trying to happen. And, and I would say that uh, developing countries, including Southeast Asia, should continue to advocate for whatever they can in terms of moving the WTO reforms uh, and, and, and as much as possible using WTO where it is the multilateral body to come up with uh, the rules, right? Like the trade and, trade and climate change, I think that should be, that should be discussed uh, in the WTO. Uh, services uh, and um, digital, there are plur plural, plural, what do you call it? Plurilateral, <laughs> plurilateral agreements that are trying to uh, happen in those areas as well. And, and, and again, a lot of them are, are quite parallel to what IPEF aspirations are. So APEC, IPEF aspirations, they get translated. Some of them have been translated into WTO agreements or regional agreements. You know, so it's, it, you can, it, they're complementary. And I think uh, we as ASEAN, we should be uh, looking at all these things uh, in, in, in a totality and, and play a role for uh, our own uh, interests as well as for the regional interests in, in how these things should be moving. Thank you. All right, we're gonna take one more question. We're almost at time. Uh, and this comes in from Virginia Gunawan with VOA Indonesia. What does the West or China not understand or maybe choose to ignore about ASEAN in terms of trade, security, or politics? That's a very open and loaded question. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is. It's, very, it's hard to answer, too. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, what does the West not understand about ASEAN is that, uh, first of all, that we, we shouldn't be asked to take sides. 
uh, we cannot take sides. Uh, we have always been, uh, you know, a region and country-wise. Uh, well, what is it, what is it called? Um, you know, zero uh, zero enemies and one thousand friends. <laughs> we we want to be we want to be, be having a balanced relationship uh, with all because we are equally uh, dependent uh, trade and investment wise with China, U.S. and Europe, right? So we want to have a balanced uh, relationship. So uh, not taking sides and not having. I think the other thing is that the, the West often uh, says, "Okay, climate, you got to go climate, uh, human rights, labor, you know, uh, hey, development, you know." It, whatever you ask us to do, it needs to be integrated with the development outcome. It can't just be climate for the sake of, of climate. And oftentimes this is where, or, or even democracy for that matter, you know, all these issues uh, tend to be very uh, uh, one-sided and, and not recognizing the development and political and institutional challenges of Indonesia, of, 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 of the developing countries and Southeast Asia. Now, for China, I think, uh, for China, uh, it has always been about how can you, how can Chinese investments and Chinese Belt and Road and Chinese uh, trade uh, uh, benefit the country in question. So Indonesia, just to give it uh, Indonesia as an example, you know we've gone through kind of uh, uh, not so good investments from China. And, and then now uh, asking, okay, China, we want quality investments, including on the environment side, uh, as well as uh, contributing to our uh, domestic development, et cetera, et cetera. So I think China needs to also see, uh, not in a mercantilistic and commercial, just the mercantilistic and commercial uh, aspects of their investment and trade relationship. They need to see the developmental aspect and not separate it out. You know, I think they have this new initiative called Global Development Initiative. I don't quite know uh, what 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 is in there, but the intention was to kind of overcome the criticism of of the Belt and Road, which was seen as not being too beneficial uh, to the uh, to the countries that the recipient countries. Uh, so how can they uh, adopt a more internationalized uh, concept of of the way they, they do trade, it's, you know, trade investment and development assistance capacity building uh, that is going to benefit the country because otherwise you will see and you have seen pushback, right? Anti-Chinese uh, demonstrations, not just in, in, in Southeast Asia, but in Africa and elsewhere. So I, I think China also needs to, to learn about how, how to be a good international citizen and investor and trade uh, partner. All right. Well, thank you very much. We are at time. So please join me in thanking Ibumari for her time. Thank you. Thank you.